Welcome to the Christian Mysticism Podcast, where we explore the transcendental, the supernatural, and near-death experiences. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. Hey guys, today's guest is John Carter, who recently had a near-death experience where he died from sepsis poisoning, and today he's going to tell us about it. John, if you'd like to just tell us a little bit about the few days leading up to your near-death experience and share your amazing testimony with us. Sure, thank you, uh, Cody. I, first of all, I want to thank you for um, allowing me this opportunity to speak to your guests. Uh, I uh, have a message to get out, and I'll get to that later, but... Uh, uh, it's pretty uh, prolific, uh, to say the least. But uh, uh, let me just start out by saying that uh, 2020 uh, wasn't a very good year for a lot of us. Um, many folks, uh, obviously, many folks died from COVID that year. Um, it was the year of the pandemic, so to speak. And uh, for me, it was a little bit of everything. I went through some really bad uh medical experiences uh, in my life and I uh, on July 29th of uh, 2020 I uh, collapsed uh, in my bedroom and uh, I uh, it was from sepsis poisoning now I didn't know that at the time it was in my bloodstream and it was attacking my organs and uh, when I collapsed I I uh, was out of it and and woke up about five days later for about maybe five minutes long enough to in the dark to find my cell phone thank God and I was able to dial 911 but uh, my organs were starting to shut down as uh, I had been kind of knocked out for about five days and I hadn't been found for five days and um, uh, when the cavalry did come and get me out of there I uh, I went to uh, initially to uh, um, emergency room, of course, and, and uh, that's where um, initially I died. Uh, according to the doctors, they, uh, uh, the emergency room physicians, um, they said that uh, I had died once and then I can't, they got me back. And then I died again. Now, what happened was, is uh, when they got the gurney into the emergency room, um, apparently, and I knew this because I knew I had died. I, I know that sounds crazy, but it's true. Uh, I I uh, went from my body uh, up to the ceiling where my back was like on the ceiling, and I could look down on my body and I could see them working on me and I could see that the monitor was flatlined and I could, but at the same time, I'm thinking to myself, gee, I must be dead, you know, but I really, it's kind of weird. I really didn't care. I was like, it was like, it was no big deal. You know, I always thought that uh, maybe if I, you know, once I died and if there was anything after death, that I would be freaking out, you know, but uh, I really, it, it was like, part of living you know it was like part of the life experience or something but i was my back was on the ceiling and i'm looking down and there's nurses rushing around me um one's putting a needle in my arm the other one's got this thing she's putting on my face and squeezing it like this bulb and uh, the doctor gets those paddles out he puts them on my chest and he pops me and I felt my, I felt my soul go back into my body. And then I felt all that sickness again. And I was laying back inside my body. And then I died again. And I was back on the ceiling again. <laughs> and uh, apparently they lost me for a minute or two. And, uh, but this time I uh, started traveling through a, uh, kind of a, I don't know, for lack of a better way to put it, a, a vortex a tunnel type. It was oval tunnel. It was probably, um, I, I want to say in the, 
NDE, it was like a 20 by 20 oval tunnel. And I'm traveling through it and there was a light at the end of it. And pretty bright light, my, by the way. And I'm traveling through it and uh, inside the walls of that tunnel, um, I'm seeing, and I don't know why, but I'm seeing um, all the highlights of my life. Um, from three years old, all the way up through high school, um, all the good moments though, all the really enjoyable moments, um, everything that really happened to me that kind of stood out in my life that I really enjoyed, I, that's what I was seeing. Um, and I saw some things I wasn't, I didn't recognize, like, uh, when I was three years old, my, apparently my dad got me a uh, a little car uh, that you could push, little metal car, uh, red metal car that you could push with your feet. And uh, I did not know that he, I could not remember that far back that he had gotten me that. And uh, when I got back from all of this and got well, my, 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 uh, I asked my older sister, I said, you know, um, did dad ever buy me a, a, like a metal car for my three-year-old, you know, birthday? And she said, yes, he did. And that freaked me out. So, but anyway, I'm traveling through this vortex tunnel and, uh, you know, I'm seeing the first woman I fell in love with. And, you know, I, I go through, see my first marriage and, um, see the birth of my children and, you know, see, I'm seeing all the highlights of my life. Um, and as I finally get up to the point where um, I'm at about 60, 61 years old, I'm right at that light. I mean, the further I traveled, the further I traveled towards this white light. And it was like a big veil got pulled back. Like somebody, like if you were at a... Uh, like a theater, if you were watching a theater program and they just, just real fast pulled the veil back, you know, or the curtains back. Um, then I, I felt myself, I, well, first of all, I saw the most beautiful sky I've ever seen in my life. Um, and it was a sky, not, it wasn't like earth. It was, uh, it was a color I've never seen before. Um, and I can't explain it because uh, how do you explain a, a color that you've never seen before? Um, I just remember it, but I can't, I can't even come up with the colors for, for any of the things I saw up there because uh, I, um, you know, and I'm an amateur artist. I've tried to mix paints and stuff to come up with some of those colors, but I can't, I can't, for, for whatever the reason, I can't seem to do it. Um, but anyway, I'm looking at this beautiful sky and somebody, and I'm laying in the dirt like a mud. I can smell the mud, you know. And, uh, but it still has a pleasant smell. It just smells like it's earthy. And somebody has me in their left arm and my soul uh, feels very sick and very thirsty at this point. And even if, when I was traveling through the light, it felt that way too. And when I uh, looked to my right, um, I was shocked because it was Jesus Christ that had me in his left arm. And he reached down into a bucket, like a wooden bucket you'd see in, you know, Roman times or Judean times real old bucket, uh, wooden bucket. And, uh, he used like a, instead of using a spoon, it was like a, like a half of a gourd split in half or something like a big spoon. He dipped it into the water and he put the water up to my lips. And he said, in the name of the father or in the name of my father, he said, and he poured it down my throat. And all of a sudden I felt this I mean, I, I was, 
uh, it felt like I had, you know, like when you're on earth and you have a, an ice cold Sprite after mowing the lawn for, you know, four hours and you're soaking in sweat. Um, it felt that way. It, it was so refreshing, unbelievably refreshing. And, uh, and then he dipped it back into the bucket again. And he said, in the name of, of the sun and he poured it down my throat and and again i felt this refreshing uh overwhelming feeling that this uh, water was bringing to my uh soul as he poured it down my throat and i for whatever the reason i my soul manifested itself as if that i felt like i was uh, still within my body, but I wasn't. Um, it was just a soul. And, but I mean, I'm, I, I could see my hands and I could see my legs, and, but it, but that was far gone. That was back on that gurney back in the emergency room. Um, what I thought I was seeing was my, apparently I was seeing what my soul looked like in heaven. And, uh, well, he dips it back into the bucket again. And he said, in the, in the name of the Holy Spirit, and he pours it over my head. And this time I really got, this one was really, I mean, I, it really shook me up because it, it went, ran down over my face and over into my body. And, and I, I felt um, like I was given uh, a gift, all kinds of gifts. I mean, but my heart, um, grew like 50 times um, or what I felt like was a heart. My insides were just full of love and compassion and kindness. And um, I was at this point kind of in shock and, and uh, he helped me to my feet and I looked to my right and I, I said, you're Jesus Christ, aren't you? And he said, yes, I am. And he smiled and, and I said, you know, and I right away, I started thinking, man, I'm really not worthy to be here. I started feeling guilty, you know? I was kind of freaking out a little bit. I thought, geez, you know, I really shouldn't be here. I was a sinner on earth. You know, I, I uh, hadn't gone to confession in years. And I thought, man, I, you know, sure you got the right guy here, I'm thinking. And uh, so I asked him, I said, Jesus, um, thank you for helping me. I said, but I don't think I'm the guy that's supposed to be here. And he said, he smiled and he put his arm around me again. And he said, John, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. And I had no clue what he was talking about. Honestly, I didn't. I mean, I was like, okay, if you say so. <laughs> uh, but I mean, the sky, there was these rolling hills in front of me full of flowers and just gorgeous. I mean, again, the grass, the fields, the flowers. Um, there was a long grass and flowers, and but it was all colors I'd never seen before. Even the flowers looked different than flowers in this realm. And uh, I was just stunned. I was completely taken aback. And I, right away, I saw this gigantic angel to my left and the only reason I noticed it was because um, his wings were so big uh, he had the most beautiful white wings looked like they were bleached or something they were so white I mean they were just like pure white and the guy had blonde hair and it was wavy and these wings are attached to his back and he's got vestments on like a uh, breastplate like you'd see in a an old medieval film or something. And uh, he's got a sword on his hip and it's sheathed and he's got ankle, you know, um, armor on and uh, foot armor on. And I asked Jesus because I had no clue who I was looking at. And I asked Jesus, I said, that is the most beautiful angel I have ever seen. I said, who is that? He said, that's St. Michael. 
I said, he, he said that he's my archangel and he's the one that brought you here. And I was like, whoa. I was like, okay. And I looked at him, the angel again, and I smiled and he smiled back at me. And uh, so that was like an amazing thing. And, and I, Jesus said, walk with me. And we started walking and he said, I want you to meet a couple guys here that, that uh, I think you might know. And there were two monks. And the first one was, I recognized it was St. Francis of Assisi uh, because of his haircut and the, the Franciscan robes that he had on. And uh, he had the, where, where he had the wounds in his hands and in his side and in his feet, there was like a piercing glow. And Jesus had this as well. It was like a piercing glow um, that just stood out uh, from these wounds. And the other monk had the same thing. And, um, and St. Francis said in Italian, um, hello, my brother in Christ. And I didn't, I remembered, or I mean, I, I couldn't, rem he said it in Italian. I didn't know Italian, obviously. So when I got back, I, I looked, I looked up what he had said and I found out exactly um, what he had said by kind of piecing some of the words together that sounded familiar. And uh, that's how, that's exactly what he said. He said, hello, my brother in Christ. And he gave me a hug and Padre Pio did the same thing. And, but I didn't know it was Padre Pio. That was the other monk. He was kind of heavy set and he had a, a beard and uh, he gave me a hug. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? You know, I, you know, I recognize St. Francis, but I didn't know who this guy was. But he had a smile on his face and was very kind. Um, and when you hug these people up there, you feel so much love and so much compassion and kindness. And, uh, and then I turned to Jesus and I looked in his eyes. And when I, my, my eyes met his eyes, I mean, I saw so much love, an overbounding amount of love i mean it was just so much love and compassion and kindness and 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 uh i mean he he just emanated i guess that's a good word emanated all of these things um a hundred times over um and i my eyes could not they were fixated on his eyes. And uh, there's a lot of truth to the saying that the eyes are the window to the soul, because I think Jesus was looking right down into my, which I exactly what I was. He was looking right into my soul. And, and I saw the most amazing man I have ever met in my life. And of course he's the King of Kings and, lord of lords and here i am walking in heaven with him and uh i kept feeling guilty about that be less than honest if i didn't say that and uh i was and as we kept walking um i he walks me in front of this field and and this field goes for what seemed like maybe miles and all i can see in front of me uh, way off in the distance, I see a shining light, but all I see in front of me are all these people. And they're probably a good hundred yards away from me. Um, the first line of people, but they're all talking with each other and, uh, smiling and, uh, joking with each other. And apparently it's like a, um, they all kind of knew each other in a way. And, um, I looked at Jesus and I said, uh, you know, Jesus, uh, I said, who are these people? And he said, 
these are your relatives, John. He said, I'm going to walk you that way. He said, but I want you to know something before you get a chance to meet your relatives. He said, you're not staying. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I'm going to send you back. And I said, well, why are you doing that? Because <laughs> to be honest with you, I didn't want to leave. I mean, it was so beautiful up there. And I, you know, I was just taken aback. And Jesus said, uh, well, he said, I'm sending you back because I don't like what's going on in the world right now. And I said, could you be more specific? And he said, yes. He said, uh, there's too much hate in the world. He said, too many people hate one another. He said, and I want you to teach people to love one another as I love them. An innocent love like a three-year-old would bring to, a, to an adult I, uh, that they love. He said, that's, that's the kind of love that I want you to teach. Teach people to love unconditionally, but to learn to love one another. And I thought, okay, I, you know, I'm thinking, okay, I could probably do that. Um, and he said, but I want you to teach it to the world. And I said, Jesus, I said, are you sure you got the right guy for this? Started questioning myself, you know. I said, uh, this is a big mission. And he said, John, if you have faith, you know, you can move mountains. And uh, he said, I'm coming back someday to earth. And I thought to myself, should I ask him when, you know, but then I thought, no, nah, it's probably not a good idea because, you know, that's Jesus Christ. And, you know, I had already questioned him a little too much as it is asking him a big question like that. I, I didn't think it was appropriate. So I, uh, I just said, you know, he said, I'm coming back. He said, I'm coming back soon. He said, but in the meantime, I want you to go try and teach as much love and spread the gospel as much as you can. Teach people to love one another, to pray for their enemies, and to and to teach others to teach each other to love one another. And I thought, okay. And I'm thinking, boy, do I got a mission, you know? Man, that's that's a lot. Well, um, he said, now let's go meet your family. And I walked up and the front line of my family, there's my dad and my mom and my little, uh, in her right arm, she's got my little um, nine-year-old uh, niece who had died from a diabetic coma. And uh, she was an angel on earth anyway, but uh, you know, I'm talking with my mom and dad and I'm hugging them. I'm hugging all my relatives, my aunts and uncles. And they're all kind of surrounding me and patting me on the back and telling me, you know, how much they loved me and missed me. And it was just amazing. And as I went back further into the crowd, um, then I started seeing my grandfather, uh, my other grandfather, my two grandmothers, um, and all of their brothers and sisters and relatives that were up there. And, and, uh, and then I went back further and the clothing started changing. I noticed that I picked up on it because he, apparently you can look the way you want to look in heaven and, you know, whatever age you felt comfortable with on earth, that's the way you can look in heaven. So I'm, I'm wading into this crowd and, as I further I get back, I'm introduced to my great 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 grandfather, and and uh, talks to me about the Civil War, and I meet my uh, I f go even further back than that. I I met a and the further I back I get, um, you could tell that it went from English to uh, different languages because. Um, the further back I went, the, generationally speaking, um, that's the way apparently that they were lined up. It was like generation after generation. But I'm meeting all of these hundreds of people, and most of them that were in my past, I had no clue who they were, short of some pictures and so forth I had seen. 
uh, you know, old pictures. And uh, those were still re relatively recent. And the further I got back, I, I ran into this guy that was uh, pushing a cart full of sausages. And the sausages smelled really good. And he was kept trying to give me one, but he was speaking in like Hungarian or Czechoslovakian or something. I don't know what he was speaking in. Might have even been Turkish or something. I don't know. He was dressed really weird. He was dressed like he was in the, uh, um, I, I want to say the Renaissance or Middle Ages. And uh, the sausages had, it was weird because they had this webbing on them, like a roped webbing. I never saw that before. And uh, and uh, if, it, if you want to know what Jesus looked like, he had a, uh, the clothing he had on was very simple. Um, his hair was, uh, I found a picture of him, by the way. And folks can go to my website to see the picture. I found the exact picture of him and I had to really search for it online to find it. But I did find it. And it's, uh, if you go to my website uh, re regarding my NDE, it's www.john dash carter.org again that's www.john dash carter.org and you can see a picture of what jesus actually looks like and uh it was you know a spitting image of him so you know i put that on my website so folks could see it but anyway jesus looked really really um i mean it, you know he didn't have great white robes on or was you know gold all over him no nothing like that it was he was very simple uh the clothing was looked like a typical tunic uh from judea type tunic and he had a rope around his waist and he had sandals on he had long brown hair he had brown eyes and uh he had a and boy those eyes were just i can't say enough about those and the and the long beard and um, he, uh, well, anyway, he, you know, he puts me into this crowd and I'm going back even further. I see this guy that's dressed like a, uh, uh, he had a bucket helmet on with a cross and, and uh, white vestments on with a red cross and had all the chain mail and a sword and everything. And uh, I had no clue who he was and, when I got back and got well, my sister, I asked her about that. And of course, she's a somewhat of a historian. And she said, uh, sounds to me like we might have had relation that might have been in the Crusades years and years ago um, because he was up there. Uh, there was also guys that were dressed like those old uh, guys that uh, the old, I guess they're called the Swiss Guard at the Vatican. They got those uh, puffy pants and, the, you know, the helmet that looks like it's from Spain, old Spain, and the swords. And uh, they're up there. And and, uh, and I, I uh, ran into um, a lot of uh, people that I didn't think I'd ever run into in a million years. Uh, relation that... Uh, uh, and I should point out that it wasn't just Catholics up there. Uh, there were people up there from every uh, modern day Christian faith that I could think of. I mean, there were, you know, people that I knew that were Lutherans and because it wasn't just my family I ran into. I ran into a lot of friends and their families um, and why they were up there. I don't know. But they thanked me for for um help is i either help someone on back on earth that they knew or um i was close to somebody friendship wise that they knew on earth and they thanked me um you know uh i knew a, a lady that i'm friends with it's a good christian lady and and uh, her father i met up there and then the lady that um i I've been friends with since high school. Uh, I met her uh, husband who had passed on 
up there and he thanked me for protecting her all these years. And uh, I met a, uh, trying to think of some others that I met that really weren't related to me. I met a lot of people like that. And I mean, finally, you know, it was very overwhelming. And uh, I, uh, as I was walking through this uh, gigantic crowd, the smell of those flowers and the sky and the, the beauty of heaven is, you know, I want to say magnificent, but magnificent really doesn't do it justice. It's, um, it's a thousand times. If you, if you use the word magnificent and you magnified it, a million times that's how beautiful it is up there and that's no that's no i mean that's that's an understatement it really is i did not want to leave but i didn't have much of a choice and i uh finally after going through and what seemed like hours on end i mean it seemed like about eight or nine hours i was getting tired and i finally laid down in this field and the smell, oh, it was just unbelievable, overwhelming. And when I woke up, I was in ICU at a uh, hospital um, up in Mishawaka, Indiana. And they were transferring me by ambulance. Uh, but before they did that, I woke up and I was intubated in ICU. And I saw my my son and my daughter through the window because of COVID, they had masks on. And um, they both crying and uh, I smiled at them and I gave them a thumbs up and they smiled. I could see that they smiled back, you know, underneath their masks, but they were looking through a window at me and uh, it was then that I started uh, on my long nine month road of going from medical institution to medical institution, uh, getting well. And they transferred me up to uh, Regency Hospital because there was too much COVID in Mishawaka. First, I went from Plymouth to Indiana to Mishawaka, Indiana. Then from Mishawaka, because there was too much COVID at both of those hospitals. Then, and I didn't have COVID at the time. Then they transmitted to Regency Hospital in Portage, Indiana. And there they, they had a bed for me because they had like a non-COVID unit. And they were big. They're much bigger, apparently. So, But I had a doctor there for basically every organ. And they went to work on me. And, it, and they checked everything, you know, every organ. Because all my organs were failing. I had to have kidney dialysis and... They checked my heart and um, I had to go down and once they got my kidneys straightened out, my lungs and and liver and everything, then they sent me down to uh, Indianapolis by ambulance again. Uh, and it was there that they gave me uh, open heart surgery and they changed my aorta out on my heart. And uh, when they changed the aorta out on my heart, they put in a cow's aorta. I guess they can do that now on my heart. And, uh, you know, now I tell people to uh, eat chicken and stay away from beef. But uh, that's a joke, by the way. But anyway, I, uh, you know, I, I uh, it's really strange. But once I got that new aorta in, I all the blood started flowing in the right direction. And then I really started feeling better. But then they sent me up to a rehabilitation place up in, uh, in Mishawaka, Indiana again. And there, guess what? They gave me COVID. <laughs> and uh, they sent me back down to Indianapolis. And this was after they stuck me in a nursing home for about a month. And that was a horrible experience. And then they sent me back down to Indianapolis. And I was in COVID ICU there for a while. And uh but throughout all of this, I knew I was going to get better because Jesus promised me that. He said, you're on a mission. 
And at my age, even my personal physician, uh, when I finally did get the chance to see her after I'd gotten well, she said, uh, I'm surprised you're here. She said, most people your age were dying like crazy. And she said, you, it's a, it's a miracle that you're here. And so I, I attribute that all to God, but, uh, I was down there and, and, uh, I noticed when I was in COVID ICU that they were intubating a lot of people and there were people dying like crazy down there. Uh, it was, it was really, I mean, it was sad. It was very sad because I got to, you know, the, the, a lot of the relatives, you could see the looking, looking through the ICU, you know, they couldn't meet with their, the people that were dying and you could see how sad they were, uh, that they couldn't be with them. And I, I felt bad for them, but I myself was trying to get well and, and, uh, they tried to intubate me. And I noticed that when they intubated people like two or three days later, those folks were dead. So I wouldn't let them intubate me. I said, you need to use remdesivir on me, you know, give me some of that. And, uh, so the doctor said, okay, we'll try it. They put it in me. I don't know why that got put into my head. I'm assuming that God put it there. And pretty soon, all this stuff started coming up. I started coughing up all this garbage, suctioning it, you know, and getting rid of it. And uh, pretty soon, I was found to be asymptomatic. They sent me down to a lower level. And then I went to, I was fine. They sent me to um, uh, open heart surgery rehab in Indianapolis at a five-star place down there. It was there that I really went to work on myself and, and, uh, got well and got my heart where it needed to be. And, uh, now I'm back home. I've been back home since, uh, April. Now, since then I had to have my gallbladder taken out. That was a bit of a chore, but, uh, that was just like a 10 day stay in the hospital. But, uh, you know, I've, I've been back home and, uh, I, uh, I'm slowly but surely getting back on my feet, but at the same time, I'm, uh, you know, really, really getting my ministry going. I've done about seven, eight, nine podcasts now. Um, this is probably my ninth or 10th and, uh, I'm excited to do them because I want people to know that a, there's a heaven and, uh, you know, if there's a heaven, there's gotta be a hell because evil exists. And I found this to be the case since I've been back. Uh, and obviously I knew that before I even left, but, um, because, you know, you're going to have bad people out there, but, uh, anyway, um, but, uh, all things considered, um, I've been given a lot of gifts with the Holy spirit and I'm using every one of them, but I'm using them humbly. Um, and I'm finding out that I've got more gifts than I thought. I was kind of shocked by that. But at the same time, I mean, I, I'm learning different languages now and I'm, and it's coming to me pretty easy. You know, I, I struggled with freshman Spanish, you know, when I was in high school and, uh, now I'm learning Russian and I'm learning the Filipino dialects and, uh, I mean, I, it's coming to me pretty easy. And I think the next thing I'll do is uh, work on Latin because I've had a chance to uh, run into that, believe it or not, even though it's a dead language. I've ran into that a few times. So um, and that's my story. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll fe feel free to answer them. Well, I know the floating on the ceiling experience and the tunnel experience and the light at the end of the tunnel. That's a universal near-death experience. Started with, um, I, I think, Raymond Moody in the 1970s when people started reporting that this um, this really happens when you die. Um, I just had a few questions. Um, just sure. Uh, um, I know you saw um, Jesus mentioned that Michael, the archangel is the one who brought you up there or through the tunnel or um, how how tall was Michael the Archangel when when you saw him I know you saw his wings how tall would you say he was his wings were much taller than he was uh, I would say he was probably maybe six two 
or so. And his wings, I would say, were probably at least 16, 17 feet high. There was another um, uh, near-death experiencer on our channel who uh, also had an experience with uh, Michael the Archangel. He, um, um, that was a different experience. He was in um, an outer dark. He, he didn't get to go to heaven. It was a totally different experience. But um, he did mention that Michael was absolutely beautiful. Um, yeah, he was. Are you any by any chance a uh, former law enforcement, a former military or anything like that? Yeah, I uh, I used to be, uh, that was my last job. Um, I was a federal air marshal. I worked for the United States government. I protected people uh, in the air uh, from uh, terrorism. That was my, well, commonly well, known as a FAM. I do notice um, that the, some of these people who get to meet Michael the Archangel, because he's the patron saint of military men and policemen and soldiers, they tend to have these experiences, and it's 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 it's. it's I find it absolutely wild. Yeah, um, I never put that. I never put two and two together until I got back and somebody told me that. Uh, what was it so uh, specifically about heaven so that was so delightful besides the beautiful landscape and the colors? And was there an o overwhelming feeling of just peace, bliss? How happiness, did... happiness and, and joy. It, it was like a big party up there. I mean, not a party that you'd go to where people are, you know, misbehaving. I'm talking about a party where uh, everybody was so happy. And so glad to see one another and and so uh, joyous and kind and loving and considerate. And um, it was such a an amazing place. And I really must have been on the and I don't know, because I really didn't get the chance to explore as much as I probably would have liked to. But I saw a shining light in the distance from these hills and i'm and since i've been back i feel in my spirit that that was probably heaven uh where the mansions are because jesus i failed to mention that when i was up there jesus said i'm you know in my in my father's house are many he told me this in my father's house are many mansions and i go to uh prepare a place for you and for your friends and your family and and I thought, wow, you know, because I'm still thinking while I'm up there that, you know, I really didn't even belong to be there. You know, I felt guilty. And that's the truth. I did. I didn't feel worthy. A lot of people who who clinically die and come back and have these um, some of these near death experiences, they notice they come back with spiritual gifts, supernatural gifts that they didn't have before. Have you? noticed anything like that and if so are you willing to share any any kind of um... yes yes i uh i have a spirit of uh you have to understand that first of all time there is not like time here time there i mean you could be what what is maybe a few seconds here up there can be in heaven can be eight ten hours you know there, it's a completely different time realm up there and when you're on the other side there's a very thin veil between this realm and that realm and the only reason i say that and i didn't know that myself until i started um saying the rosary um and really really focusing on mary and when i said the rosary and jesus and and really um uh, adamantly and strongly praying and understanding the necessity of the prayers that I was saying that um, I could uh, I was able to uh, get a message from the other side from uh, one of my relatives and uh, he said John, I want you to tell my mom, eleven, eleven, and I was in deep prayer when he said this. But he spoke 
across that realm and I could hear him. And I thought, 11, 11, you know, that's weird. And so I went to his mother and I said, listen, now, while I was in deep prayer, I said, you're probably going to think I'm crazy. But I said, your son came to me and told me to tell you 11, 11. And she, I mean, she about fell off. She about fell, almost fell down. I mean, she was just like, it just blew her away. And she said, Do you, she said that was something that me and him, it was a, a, like a secret thing that they had to go together where they would talk about both of them being angels someday. And 1111, I guess, has to do with being an angel or something. And I had no clue what he was talking about. And, uh, you know, it kind of scared me because, you know, I had no idea what, how she was going to react. I you know, think she, uh, maybe I was nuts or something, but when she, uh, she was crying and I mean, it just blew her away. And then there was another lady that actually came to me. You see, I get a lot of emails on my website and I want to give you my website again, folks, my website again, because folks can reach out to me if they want to. It's www.john-carter.org. Uh, anyway, um, there was a lady that reached out to, I get thousands of emails every day. And uh, she reached out to me and uh, I felt in my spirit that I needed to speak to her. And so I called her and she said, my son died about a week ago from fentanyl poisoning. And um, she was just, you know, so distraught. And I, of course, I prayed with her and I, I felt so bad for her. Uh, but uh, she said, is there any way that you can, you know, uh, get a message to him? And I said, well, I don't know if I can get a message to him. But in deep prayer, I said, I'll try and get a see if he'll bring a message to me. And so I once again, I was saying the rosary again, because uh, that's the way that I was able to reach across that realm. And I was in deep prayer. And sure enough, I heard a message from this particular young man. And he said to tell, he said, tell my mom that I'm okay. I'm in heaven and, um, and I'm very happy. And so I went and I told his mom that. And I mean, she just thanked me up one side and down the other, but, and, and, of course, now we're good friends to this day. And of course, I prayed with her and so forth. But I uh, I can do that. But it's it. I have to be in deep meditation and prayer, deep meditation and prayer to Mary and to the saints and to Jesus. And I've been able to do that. I've been able to successfully do that. Um, there is another gift I was given. A lady came to me and wrote me and said that she was under uh, severe, or actually her husband wrote me, I'm sorry. And he said that she was under, and she wrote me too, but her husband wrote me initially and said that, uh, she said that she was under severe demonic possession. And uh, I said that I called her husband and I said, I'll be glad to pray with you and her and let's see what we can do. But I felt my spirit a calling to help. And so I called her and I talked by video FaceTime and her husband was sitting next to her and I started praying with them both. And that the particular demon that was in her started flipping out. I mean, that demon went bananas. I mean, she was, she was cussing me. She was, she was using a, a language that I had never heard of. Um, it sounded almost like a, um, something from uh, like maybe, uh, well, oh, I want to say Latin, but it's it, maybe archaic. There's a word that I want to use, but it sounds like it sounded really old language. I felt in my spirit, the language was very old. And I approached this demon carefully. I, 
I called him out and I said, what's your name? And he wouldn't give me his name. And he, he said, you know, he made her head go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, you know, and, and, uh, and this was very violent. She was convulsing and husband was trying to hang on to her. And the demon kept saying, I am nothing. I am nothing. And, and, uh, I was praying and, and I said, Jesus, I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, you know, you need to leave that woman uh, right now. You need to leave her. And finally, after um, what seemed like maybe three or four hours of just praying and, and finally I got the name of him uh, out of out of I got his name out you know I was able to get him to tell me his name and I told him I said you know don't come back I said do not come back this woman is a woman of God and and she is under God's protection and I we both prayed to Saint Michael to put his angels around her and to protect her from evil and after a long time, she got freed, and now she's posting videos on YouTube and talking about how she was freed, and uh, what opened that window, and I didn't know this, but she, she mentioned it in her video, what opened that window to demonic behavior, where it allowed demonic behavior into her life, was she was involved in something called Reiku, I don't know what that is, it has something to do with... Um, some kind of strange, I don't know if it's magic or has to do with rocks or stones or whatever. Um, there, you know, there are, I found that, that since I've been back, that there are a lot of windows to um, allow demonic behavior into one's life. There are a lot of windows that can be opened. And when you invite that into your life, a lot of times, demons or even the devil can take you up on it um i since i've been back i know that uh there's been and of course we've all we're all aware that there's been these uh, shootings in schools and so forth and uh i noticed that uh they showed showed me a video of that shooter in Texas that uh, I actually got a chance to watch that video where he was uh, entering the school and immediately I knew in my spirit, I mean, it just jumped out at me. I said, I know who that is. And it wasn't that kid. It was Satan himself that was in that kid. Now I'm talking about the Satan. I'm not talking about one of his demons here. I'm talking about the Satan, okay? And he went, and he's the one that did that damage to those kids. And he's the one that created the confusion because the devil is the author of confusion. He's the author of confusion, and he's the author of chaos. And he created that confusion among those police officers which held them back from protecting those little children. Now, I want to point out that all those little children were martyred. I mean, they're all in heaven now with Jesus. But that was Satan that did that. And now I'm finding out, like, this latest shooter, there was a shooter at a, another location, and uh, he said that um, he was getting demonic messages to do this and I believe them <laughs> because uh, think about it uh, what normal legitimate person could go into a schoolroom but with full of little kids and do something like that they'd have to be demonic they'd have to you know and it it turns out that in many of these, I can't speak for all of them, but in many of these cases that I've seen, that is the case. Um, that 
many of these children grow up and they're they're not brought up with uh um you know getting any of the sacraments of the church or um if they're protestants they don't go to church or um if they're you know they don't get a chance to uh do any altar calls at a at a protestant church or things like that and i want to point out that when i was in heaven there were people like i said from christian denominations up there i'm talking lutherans anglicans um baptists southern baptists uh methodists um presbyterians uh i mean if you can think of one a modern mainstream christian religion they were up there and it wasn't just catholics so jesus doesn't discriminate he doesn't if you've lived a a good and honorable life and you've and you've put in your time to help humanity, so to speak, in many different ways people can. It's recognized, you know, and it's not, but it, if you also have a degree of faith, at least, and, you know, I grew up Catholic. I was an altar boy for years, and I went to, I even went to a seminary for a year to be a priest. Now, that didn't work out, but, um, Yes, I've been given a lot of gifts, I guess, if that answers your question. Now, I don't do exorcisms all that often, but when I I have done two since I've been back, and they were very grueling. One of them lasted probably the, with the lady about six hours. The other one lasted a good 16 or 17 hours. It was that long. Um, very grueling, very grinding, um, and it I'm not going to lie. It took a took a took a little piece out of me. I mean, it was hard because these demons and hell is real, and when demons are fallen angels, um, Satan when he was cast down, um, you know, he was an archangel. And uh, see, all of this stuff I didn't know. He was an archangel, and. Uh, when he was cast down, his his angels were cast down with him, and that's who roams the world this now, and that's who creates all the chaos and wars and, and rumors of wars and and all the things that are evil that are going on in today's society. That who is that's who's behind it, and uh, that uh, you know I can say that um, very very honestly because I I feel it. I can sense it. It's very interesting that you say that um, there is no religion in heaven. Um, a lot of near-death experiences say that passing over onto the other side, that the other side seems almost more real than this life, and that this life is kind of dreamlike compared to the spiritual world. Would you say that's correct, or would you say they're both equally as feel as real uh, to you? I would say it's more vivid. The word I want to look for is vivid. It's it's much more grandiose than it is here. I mean, like a thousand times more. The grandeur is a thousand times more beautiful than it is here. That's not to say that the earth and the sky and the planets and the universe isn't beautiful. It is. In fact, uh, you know, I, I got to thinking about that the other day and I asked myself the question, what about the universe? You know, we're just a tiny grain of sand floating around in a, uh, you know, billions upon trillions of, of different asteroids or planets and solar systems and galaxies and you name it. And, uh, and I thought, and, and the quest, the answer came to me that, you know, God is, we don't know everything about God. We don't know all the answers, you know? I mean, we know we know what we're given to know. God, give, What God gives us, that's what we know. But he's only going to give us so much. You know, not even, the Bible says, not even the angels in heaven know when Jesus is going to come back. So if they don't know, we certainly don't know. And 
you know, you can say, people can say, well, you know, it, it, we're getting close to that age. That's possible. And I, I, Jesus did tell me that he was coming back soon, but soon could be 400 years from now. We don't know, you know, because it's a different time frame they have up there. And so, um, it's a different realm altogether up there. But when you cross over, it's, and that's really what I call death is crossing over. When you cross over, um, it's just, it's, it's, I mean, I, you know, it was such a beautiful and wonderful place that I didn't want to leave. But now that I'm back, I know what to look forward to. Now, does that mean I'm going to, you know, wish or, you know, create a situation where um, I'm, you know, I want to die? No, absolutely not. I have a mission to do. I, I, I have a, I have to follow through with that mission. And that is to teach people to love one another as Jesus loves them and to pray for your enemies and to love everyone, you know, just like a three-year-old loves, you know, a parent, uh, that type of innocent love. That's the kind of love that Jesus wants us all to learn. And, and to, and, you know, what a world it would be if we all had that. And of course, Satan doesn't want any of that. You know, he's not about love. He's about hate. He's about cruelty. He's about, you know, torture and evil. He's about all that. He's he's you know, death. You know, he's about he's about all of those things. He's not about uh, um, kindness and humility and 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 love and and all the things that make Christianity. Um, and you know, a lot of people. I've been given a lot of other gifts that, uh, like I there's a lot of it's very popular among young people these days to discount christianity or say that christianity doesn't exist and i've you know been able i've had the pleasure of getting had to i've been blessed with this gift to to be able to speak to young people about the importance of learning about christianity i said you know if you don't necessarily believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God. I said, I said, uh, you know, I, I want you to know, I want you to ask yourself this question. Um, 2000 years ago, 2000 plus years ago, uh, I asked them, uh, how many poor carpenters do you think lived in Judea at that time? Um, you know, we're talking about when Rome was in control of Judea and had conquered Judea, you know, and I asked him, how many, how many Jewish carpenters do you think lived in Judea at that particular time? And a lot of them will say, you know, a thousand, maybe 500, you know, cause Judea is not a big place. Let's face it. Israel's pretty small. Um, and, uh, you know, I tell them that's probably a good ballpark figure, you know, 500, 700,000, you know, good carpenters. I said, well, out of all those carpenters, how is it that just one poor carpenter has changed the entire face of humanity and has over 3 billion followers today? How is that possible? And uh, that makes them think, oh. It makes them think. While you were in heaven, I know you met um, there were lots of people up there that you were able to meet. Did you see or have the chance of meeting or seeing uh, the Virgin Mary, the Blessed Mother? No, no, I didn't meet the Blessed Mother. Um, I, I, uh, she wasn't there uh, when I was there. I'm sure she's up there, uh, but uh, I didn't get a chance to meet her. Um, I'm afraid. I, I would have been more than blessed to, have, you know, like like uh, one of my favorite saints is Saint Bernadette, uh, you know, and and her story and and 
I, I would have been so blessed to have seen the Virgin Mary, uh, you know, the mother of Jesus, um, you know, I would have loved that, but I no, I wasn't, I wasn't blessed to see. I did get a chance to meet a couple of saints and an archangel and Jesus Christ himself. So that was more overwhelming to me than anything I could ever imagine. Um, you know, I, I didn't, uh, see any popes. I'm sure they're up there. Um, I didn't get a chance to see any, uh, like Billy Graham or, uh, you know, anyone like that when I was up there or, uh, any old, uh, you know, Protestant professors or Martin Luther or, or anyone like that, but I'm sure they're up there. I mean, these are all good people that live good godly lives. So I'm sure they're probably up there, you know, um, I feel in my spirit that, and when, when, you know, I should point out that everyone I met up there was a Christian. I want to point that out. I didn't now this may be because I don't have any relatives that were Muslim or that were Buddhist or something like that, but I didn't meet anyone that was Muslim or Buddhist or anything of that nature. That's not to say that they're not up there, though. You know, I don't know. That's not for me to say. I can only go on what I know. And I know that I met a lot of people up there from a lot of different mainstream Christian religions. If I put a link in the description of this video to your website, are you okay with people, my audience, emailing you with questions oh, if they want to reach out I to I would you. encourage it. I would encourage it. I would, because I can help. I try and help people all the time. In fact, I probably spend a good portion of my day, at least seven to eight hours a day, either talking to people by phone, praying with them, or FaceTiming them and praying with them, or talking. Sometimes I have to stay up at all hours of the night because many people contact me from different time zones from all over the world. And I have to wait until it was, you know, they wake up and like, you know, if they're in the Philippines, you know, they're 12 hours away from us. So, you know, it's, they've already, you know, there it's, it's Sunday already. And while we're still working on Saturday here. So, um, you know, it can be, you have to line up the time zones and everything um, so you can talk with them. And so you, you kind of have to walk across those time zones and figure out exactly which time zone they're in. And then you can chat with them. But I've talked to people in every continent and on every, I've talked to people from Europe, Africa, um, Asia, Australia, uh, the islands, South Pacific, um, Alaska, Russia, Ukraine. I even wrote a letter to President Putin and President Zelensky. I never heard back from either one of them, but um, I told them that they both need to sit down with each other and to love one another and to hug one another. And, uh, you know, at least I gave it my best shot. It's about as good as I can do on my end, but I wish I could do more. Um, if I was given the opportunity, if somebody said, yeah, I'm going to fly you to meet both of them. Yeah. I would jump on the next plane, you know, because I would want to teach them to learn to love one another instead of, you know, each country harming each other or, at least Russia, you know, I would tell Putin, you know, get out of Ukraine, you know, just, you know, in the interest of, you know, loving your brother, let's all live as, you know, you know, friends and be kind to one another. I mean, how hard is this? You know, it's not that hard. Well, John, I just want to thank you very much for joining the show. I'm very appreciative. Oh, you're more than welcome. And thank you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity.